Hi there. So welcome to module 3, Accounting for Material. At the end of this module, you should be able to explain the various ways of stock control. You should be able to list the documents used by organization for inventory control. You should be able to understand the various stock levels and their concepts. And then you should be able to calculate the cost of inventory. Then you should be able to prepare the material control account. So these are what you have to understand when we talk about inventory or material. Now, so you remember just the model ended, model two, in cost classification that we classify cost according to nature, where we mentioned material cost, labor cost, and expenses, right? So now we want to take material, so accounting for material. The next slide will be accounting for overhead or accounting for labor, and then we'll look at accounting for overhead. So what is material? Basically, we can define material as the basic input or ingredients or components that undergo significant change in a production process. So the raw material that undergoes the process in order to turn into the finished goods is what we refer to as material. But material can take various forms, okay? Stocks or materials can take various forms. It, it can be work in progress that is finally finished goods. It can be components or spare parts. We can have inventories of uh, sub-assemblies. We can have inventory of cons consumable stores. We can have finished goods and loose tools such as pick as shovels, pliers, and hammers. So these are various forms of inventories or material that organization keep. Then the next question we ask ourselves is, all right, if we keep all those inventories in the organization, especially work in progress, raw materials, and then some finished goods, then what we must do is to control the stock. What we must do is to control the stock. So how do we control stock so that uh, we will be able to procure the right quantity of material, we'll be able to receive the raw materials well, we'll be able to issue the raw material into the production process, and we'll be able to ensure that there is material available to avoid production stoppage. That is what it refers to as stock control. So stock control simply refers to the process which involve ordering, processing, ordering, purchasing, receiving stocks into stores, storing and issuing stocks, and maintaining appropriate stock levels. So that is what stock control is about. But there are processes or major steps that are involved in stock control. So if an organization wants to control stocks, there are major steps that we have to follow, and there are seven major steps. The first one involves ordering and purchasing so the first thing we do as an organization is we place an order for our raw materials we place an order for any material that we need and then we buy it the supplier supplies it and then we pay the supplier but the second step is the reception or uh, receiving and then what inspection if the supplier brings the raw material that we have asked uh, them to bring or we have asked him to bring what we have to do is to inspect it and make sure that the raw material is what we wanted or the material is what we want for our product or our service. Then the next thing is coding. Now we will look at codification in a moment, but codification simply has to do with ascribing uh, letters alphanumerical to distinguish between materials or various materials within the store. For instance, if you have a provision shop and there are a lot of materials or you are selling a lot of things in the provision shop, as you may know already, then you would have to ascribe code to each of these uh, items in the shop. So you can say uh, uh, a soap may be AB5, um, uh, a product, another product may be A5, AC5, something like that. That is codification, all right? Uh, using alpha numerical to classify inventories in the store for easy identification then storage we must take care of how we store our inventory because you know if you don't have a good storage capacity some inventory uh some inventories will uh, suffer damage or will become obsolete is easily once the inventories are purchased they are received 
they record them to identify them easily in the store then we keep them very well in the store the next thing is to now issue the inventory from the store once we issue the inventory from the store there has to be stock taken so that we make sure that how much stock that is left and how much stock that is outstanding so we will look at stock taking also as we continue then we will look at the various stock levels that has to be set so the seventh step is setting of stock levels and we have the maximum stock level the minimum stock level the reorder stock level and uh, the average stock level all these are major stock levels that companies keep in order for them to have resources available to meet demand or to avoid production stoppage. Now, in the purchasing and issuing of material, there are about nine documents that we must understand and that is what I have put in this diagram that you see behind me. So, if you look at the diagram that I have here, it's a chart on the various departments or the various parties that are involved in relation to how each of the documents that I'm about to list are used in relation to purchasing, issuing, and receipt of inventories into the store. So let's begin with the first one. The first document is called the Purchases Requisition Note. From the diagram here, you realize that the purchases requisition note is coming from the storekeeper to the purchasing department. So a purchases requisition note is simply a document prepared by the storekeeper to the purchasing department, giving notice on the various materials that has to be bought or the new stocks that need to order replenishment. So we have we have a lot of stock in store, but we have used some of them or we've issued some of them into the production, and so we have less stock now. So the store department will now prepare a purchases requisition note to the purchasing department so that they can inform them about the various raw materials that can be procured into the organization. Now, upon the receipt of the purchase requisition note by the purchasing department, the purchasing department also sends out a document called the tender document or quotation to suppliers. So the tender document or quotation is simply a document prepared by the purchasing department to its suppliers in order to take their or obtain their terms of supply. Terms of supply here include things like their price list, their delivery time, the quantity they can deliver, the quality of their products, the reliability of their services. So all these things will be required from the supplier. So first, we prepare purchase requisition from the store department to the purchasing department. The purchase department now issues a tender document or quotation to potential suppliers so that we can obtain their terms of supply. Now, so the suppliers now will reply back or will fill the quotation and reply back to the purchasing department to give them their price list, give them their quantity, give them the quality of their products, and every other thing that relates to their terms of supply. Now, once the purchasing department receives these uh, field tender documents from all potential suppliers, the purchasing department will choose the supplier that meets the requirement of the organization. Now, when the purchasing department chooses that supplier, then the purchasing department will prepare another document called the purchases order. So the purchases order is a document prepared by the purchasing department to the supplier to send uh, goods to the organization. So we now want to place an order. So that is what we call the purchases order. Now, once the supplier receives the purchases order, the supplier is going to process the goods. Now, when the supplier processes the goods, he is now going to send the goods to the organization. The supplier sends the goods straight to the store department. Attached to the goods that is sent to the store department is another document called the goods delivery notes. So the goods delivery notes records all the details about the product, the quantity, their specification, and every description about the product. It's sent by the supplier attached to the goods to the storekeeper. 
Now, once the storekeeper receives the goods, the storekeeper also prepares a new uh, note or a new record called the goods received note. So the goods received note is this, uh, what the storekeeper prepares in order to record the quantity of the goods that have actually been received so that that can be compared with the purchases order to see if all the orders placed were actually received by the organization. Now, sometimes there, there are times when um, the supplier has sent the goods to the store but the supplier may make some mistakes and so may include some goods that are not supposed to be uh, that were not purchased or that, that was not part of the purchases order or the purchase order. In that case, what the storekeeper does is that the storekeeper can prepare another document called the goods return note, okay, or the goods rejection note. So that document will detail out the quantity of the goods that the company did not accept or the, was not part of the purchasing order which the supplier has brought and that will be taken back to the supplier. But it's usually in a rare case though. So once the goods are received by the store department, the goods are stored. Now when the goods are stored, the next document is the material requisition note. The material requisition note is a document prepared by the production department to the storekeeper to request raw materials for production process. So for instance, let's say that in this case we are producing Sobolo and so in, in the Sobolo we are producing, the production department is now requesting the raw materials for the Sobolo, the leaf that we need to use, the various ginger and the various things that we need to use in the production of Sobolo. I'm not into production of Sobolo, but I don't know why I use it. But if it is Sobolo, they will request for the raw material. The raw material that they are requesting is the material requisition note. It will be recorded there and sent to the store department then it will be issued. But there are times when um, the production department thinks that okay they would during the day produce let's say thousand bottles of Sobolo and so they will uh, request for a certain quantity of raw material. But at the end of the day, they realize that they can't produce that and we can't store the raw materials at the department, at that production department. Then the materials have to be returned to the store department. When the materials are returning to the or are returned to the store department, they are attached with a document called the material returns note. So the material return note is also a document prepared by the production department to the store department explaining or detailing out the raw materials that were received which is being returned into the store. Now, as the goods are received by the store department and some is being given to the production department, they have to be recorded. They have to be recorded well. So the document that the store department uses in order to keep track and to keep records of the raw materials that is outstanding and the raw materials that have been sold or have been issued out, there are two documents called the store ledger card and then the bean card. The bean card is usually used to record the quantity of the raw materials, okay? So we use, okay, we receive 5,000, we have issued uh, 3,000 to the production department, they have brought back 1,000, so we record, the bean card is used to record the quantity of the products. But a store ledger card, it's broader. That one records both the quantity of the raw materials as well as the price or the cost of the raw material. So it is a store ledger card that you are going to be doing something like the FIFO, the LIFO, the simple average, the weighted average, the standard price. All these things will be put on the store ledger card because on the, on the store ledger card, there are three major columns. We have the receipt, we have the issue, and we have the balance. So when we receive, we record it. When we are issuing, we record it. Then we now record the balance. Remember, the store ledger card is going to record both the quantity and then the price at which we are receiving it and then the price at which we are issuing. So these are the documents that are used in the management of inventory. I put it in a diagrammatic form like this so that you understand the flow of it. Now the last one I nearly forget is the materials transfer notes. Sometimes there are 
more than one production department or segment in the organization. So maybe the product goes through processes, so process one and process two. So when there are two departments in my diagram here, I have department A and department B. So if department A transfers raw material to department B, so instead of uh, returning the material to the store department, maybe department B requires the material. So department A can just transfer that material to department B. When they are transferring that material, they fill a document called the material transfer note. So these are the various documents that are used in the issuing and purchasing of inventory. Now the next thing we want to look at is codification of stocks. I mentioned that earlier. This refers to the use of numbers, letters and or symbols for the identification of materials. Some of the benefits gained for using codes are time savings, prevention of ambiguity, accurate identification of material leading to production efficiency, makes computer computerization easier and then more flexible. So these are the reasons why we need to code our stocks. Then the next thing we want to talk about is stock taking. So what is stock taking? You know, when you talk about stock taking, it's simply the physical counting of inventories, right? The physical counting of inventory to determine how many inventory that we have left. So for instance, if you have a provision shop, maybe at the end of every week, you want to go to the shop and find out, okay, we bought Geisha 10, we bought uh, Royal Leather 5, we bought uh, this way, one pack. How many have we sold and how much must we go and buy? That is basically what stock taking is about. So stock taking refers to the physical verification of stocks in store and checking the results against the books in that order. But there are two ways that stock taking can take place. We have what we call the continuous stock taking and then we have what we also call the periodic stock taking. So continuous stock taking is the counting and valuing of physical stocks more frequently. So this is where you go to your shop maybe every week or every day. So at the end of the day, you want to calculate, okay, how much have we sold? How much do we need to bring? That is called continuous stock taking. So that one, you are taking the stock more frequently, daily uh, or weekly or monthly. It's frequently, okay? In that case, that is continuous stock taking. But what are the uh, advantages of that? When you take your stock like that more frequently, what is the advantage you stand to gain as a business or as an individual? One, it avoids the long disruption associated with annual stock counts. You see, periodic stock taking is where you usually take the stock once a year, maybe at the end of the year. So in that case, what is going to happen is that we have to close the department or we have to close the business and then we count the inventory. But if you are taking stock on a regular basis, it means that it will not disrupt what the business of the organization you can still be undertaking business or you can schedule a time where the inventory will be counted because you are counting it every day so it will not be work involving two stock dis discrepancies are revealed promptly so for instance if you are taking stock every day you'll be able to know that your storekeeper is managing the store very well or is not managing the store very well so that if there is any change you can smell then you can quickly take actions about it but if you wait at the end of the year before you identify a discrepancy that will take a long time and that is also something that is not a good news to a company three is that you can be able to improve in the improvement in the control over stock levels will be enhanced. It serves as a moral check on store staff. That is what I was saying. So if your storekeeper knows that you're going to be coming there every day, coming there every week to check stocks, or coming there anytime during the week to check stocks, then they will have some moral checks that, hey, we can steal money, we can sell and go and buy different one and come and put in. That is where codification comes in. If you code your raw materials or you code your items in the store, when the storekeeper sells, the storekeeper cannot uh, bring in new because when it brings in new, the code will not be there in order to find it out. Then more time is available for stock counts and this reduce errors in stock counts because you are doing it regularly so there is more time. Then regular skilled stock takers can be employed to reduce likely errors. But the disadvantages associated with the stock taking in relation to 
the counting of the stock continuously it's one it's not sweet it's not suitable where less stocks are carried so it's not suitable where less stocks are carried may interfere with the core activities of the business yes uh, employment of regular stock takers may lead to additional costs. The reason is that if let's say you take your stock every at the end of every week, maybe the morning, Saturday morning, that means that the Saturday morning that you are taking your stock, people are buying or people are doing business, want to do business with the organization, but you are counting stock, that is going to what? Bring and or will interfere with the core activities of the organization. So that is continuous stock taking taking or physically verifying stock on a regular basis or more frequently. So periodic stock taking is the accounting and valuing of physical stock at the end of an accounting year, usually annually. So periodic stock taking is going to be usually at the end of the year and you count the stocks. The disadvantage associated with this one is that uh, they may, it may lead to poor record keeping and uh, omission, there may be theft and uh, pilferages, there may be damages and deterioration and evaporation, which you wouldn't have known in relation to that if you were taking a regular or continuous stock taking. And then errors in the stock counts. There may be some errors in the stock count. So these are what you have to understand when it comes to stock taking. Now we've been talking about stock, 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 inventory, 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 material, material, material. What do we mean when we say stock cost now so stock cost is simply the total cost incurred on a stock now stock cost can be made up of the cost of purchases the cost of ordering the cost of holding and even stock out cost so when we say stock cost of an organization it entails four things the cost of purchases this is the actual price you pay for the product that you are buying the ordering cost that is the cost you incur any time you are ordering the raw materials. The holding cost or the storage cost. This is the cost you pay or you incur for holding or storing your inventories. And then the stock out cost. This is the cost you incur as a result of the fact that you don't have stock. Now, if you don't have stock that it's a manufacturing organization, that means that there will be ideal time. If there is ideal time, you are paying employees but they are not working because there is no stock. It's a stock out cost. Or your provision shop, there are some stocks that you don't have in the in your shop. So, for instance, someone wants to buy bread and want to buy milo and want to buy sugar, all at one place. So they come and uh, they can get a bread, they can get a milo, but they can't get a sugar. Another time they come, they can get a bread, they can get a milo, they can't get a sugar. So what is going to happen is that they won't come there again. They would rather go to a place where they can get all at once and then they can save time and go home. So the, when you don't have the stock, when you can't meet demand, then that will also lead to what we call a stock out cost. But the big question we ask ourselves is, why would you hold inventory? Why would you keep inventory? Why would you store some inventory for your business? One, to avoid interruption in the production process due to shortages. So if you are a typical manufacturing company or you are producing a Sobolo as an example, you wouldn't want to interfere or bring in production stoppage. So there has to always be some stores, stocks of uh, raw material too to take care of seasonal fluctuation and variation in demand. So sometimes you, you know that, okay, every day I can sell 1,000 Sobolo, but that doesn't mean you should make 1,000 Sobolo every day. You can make more than 1,000 and store the rest so that in case there is a positive movement in the market, then you can quickly fall on the ones that you have stored and you will use it to save the market. To meet future shortages in supply. Yes, sometimes there will be shortages in the supply of our raw material. For instance, oil, for instance, um, uh, wood, for instance, whatever that we are engaged in, there may be shortages. So what, what businesses do is that they buy them in bulk and not store them so that if there is shortage in the market, they can rely on it and still use it to produce their products or to render their service. To take advantage of bulk discounts, sometimes there is a discount that you receive for buying things in bulk. So if you are buying in bulk, it will reduce the average or it will reduce the average cost that you are going to incur in the acquisition or the purchases of the inventory. As such, to enjoy that discount, you may want to buy in bulk and then store it. 
Another thing is to minimize the effect of inflation. Yes, you know that there is inflation all ar around. Today you buy something for two cities, tomorrow you will go, they say, two cities, 20 pesos. So to avoid this inflation issue, you can buy your stuff, skip it, so that if there is increase in the prices of the products or the service, it will not affect you much. So these are some reasons why an organization has to hold inventories. The next slide we want to talk about is stock levels. I mentioned them in, that, in the introduction. Now when we talk about stock levels, we are talking about the various levels of stock that are maintained in an organization in order not to lock up more capital, in order to take advantage of uh, favorable movement in the market, in order to uh, keep minimal amounts in capital for the organization. So there are about three or four stock levels that we will be talking about. Reorder stock level, maximum stock level, minimum stock level, then the average stock level. Now let me take you through them, then we will look at how we go about it. When we say maximum stock level, the maximum stock level means the maximum. So maximum stock level is the level of stock beyond which stock must normally be allowed to rise. So when we say, okay, as a company, our maximum stock level is 1,000, that is our storage capacity is 1,000, or we can buy 1,000 inventories and keep. That means that is our maximum stock level. Now, if you listen to that definition, I said the maximum stock level is the stock level beyond which stock must normally be allowed to rise. But there are times when um, stock will be allowed to rise above the maximum stock level. It, that will be when there is uh, a positive movement in the market. So if we say our capacity is 1,000, that is our maximum stock level. But uh, there is a festival or there is an occasion closer to our business or there is an event that we want to go and sell our product at. In that case, we wouldn't still keep 1,000 inventories. We would have to increase it in that case. But usually, under normal business circumstances, the level of stock we keep, the maximum we have to keep as an organization, is what refers to as the maximum stock level. But what are the factors that influence the level of stock that we keep? That is, what, is the, what are the factors that we have to take into consideration in order to say that our maximum stock level will be 1,000 units? The first one is the rate of consumption. This is how your, your production process is, how your demand conditions are. So if you have a rapid demand condition or you have a high market share, then you will keep a high level of stock. But if you have a low market share, then you will keep a low level of stock as your maximum stock level. Lead time or the delivery time. This is how long it takes your suppliers to supply your goods to you. So if your suppliers take longer to supply goods to you, then you have to be careful as to the level of or the quantity of stock you keep at your maximum stock level. Then the reliability of the supplier is there. General economic and political condition. Your storage capacity definitely. The rate of deterioration of the product, whether it is a perishable uh, raw material or non-perishable raw material. Then the availability of the funds. That is important because remember, the more stock you keep, the more cost you are incurring. You are going to use money to buy the stock. You are going to maintain the storage facility. You are going to pay people to manage what the store for you. So the availability of funds will determine the level of stock that you keep. So that is the first thing that we have to understand. Maximum stock level. Then the next stock level is called the reorder stock level. So let me just lay it out. Maximum stock level, reorder stock level, then we're going to have minimum stock level, then we have the average stock level. What is the reorder stock level? The reorder stock level is the level of stock at which when stock reaches, a new order must be placed for replenishment of stock. Now, why is the reorder stock level placed between the maximum stock level and the minimum stock level? The minimum stock level is the level of stock below which stock must normally be allowed, must not normally be allowed to rise, to fall. So, the minimum stock level is okay. So, our maximum stock level as a company is 1,000 units. But at worst case scenario, we have to keep 200 units for, for our business. That is the minimum stock level. So the idea of placing reorder stock level is that we place it in the middle so that by the time that suppliers will bring the product, 
the stock would have reached minimum stock level. Then the new replenishment will now take our stock back to the maximum stock level. So for instance, if our maximum stock level is 1000 and our minimum stock level is 200, then our reorder stock level may be in the middle by putting it somewhere around 600. So if really we put the stock or our stock reaches 600, then we need to start preparing for what? Replenishment of stock. So it depends on how long it takes for our suppliers to supply. That is the lead time or the delivery time. So by the time that the supplier will bring the raw material, the stock would have reached 200, that is the minimum stock level, so that that new replenishment will now take our stock back to the maximum stock level. So that is what you have to understand in relation to maximum stock level, minimum stock level, and then the reorder stock level. But all these have their own formulas that we need to apply because it is not something that we just do. So maximum stock level is simply the reorder stock level, a reorder stock level, plus the reorder quantity, then minus minimum usage times minimum lead time. I should have done that well. It's called row rock mini. Okay, row rock mini. Roll for reorder stock level, rock for reorder quantity, and then mini for minimum usage and minimum delivery time. So that is how we calculate the maximum stock level. So the terminology is roll rock mini right that is how we get our maximum stock level now so how do we do that so we calculate our real other stock level it means before you calculate your maximum stock level you must know the minimum stock levels uh, the real other stock level so what is the real other stock level real other stock level is called it's simply mama that is, you remember, Mama, I am hungry. You can calculate what the reorder stock level. So, Mama simply means maximum usage, okay, times the maximum lead time. Maximum usage times maximum lead time. Now, all these things will be provided to us in the question, and so we just have to bring in them in and look at them. Now, maximum lead time is the same as what the maximum delivery time. So, roll mini, maximum stock level is roll rock mini. That's the real order stock level plus real order quantity or the economic order quantity. We'll look at that in a moment, and then the minimum usage times the minimum delivery time. Then we come to the minimum stock level. To understand minimum stock level, we're going to use what we call the roller. Okay, so if you remember roller, then you can remember minimum stock level. Roller simply means reorder stock level. Reorder stock level minus average usage. Okay, average usage times average lead time. Or average delivery time. So that is your minimum stock level. Roller. That is three other stock level minus average usage times average lead time. Now, what is average usage? Average usage simply means your maximum usage plus your minimum usage divided by two. Then the average lead time is also the maximum lead time plus the minimum lead time divided by two. So that is how you deal with your minimum stock level. Then the final slide is the average stock level. Now, there are two ways that we can calculate the average stock level. It can be the maximum stock level, okay? Maximum stock level plus your minimum stock level divided by 2. So we can calculate the average stock level by doing this. Or another formula that we can use in the calculation of the average stock level is to use, let me get there. is to use half half of minimum stock level plus so half of reorder quantity reorder quantity plus minimum stock level now, what you have to also note is that 
What you must note also is that real other stock sorry, the minimum stock level can also be referred to as the safety stock level or what we call the buffer stock level. So these are the various stock levels that can be kept by an organization. The maximum stock level, roll rock, mimi, real other stock level, mama, minimum stock level, roller, average stock level, maximum plus minimum over two, or half of real other stock level plus the minimum stock level. So these are what you have to understand. Now, you realize that about real order quantity here. There are times when the real order quantity it's not given or may not be given in the question and you would have to calculate the economic order quantity. Now, the economic order quantity is the quantity that is ordered in order for the organization to minimize its cost, right? The quantity that is ordered in order for the organization to minimize its cost. So that is the economic order quantity. But the real order quantity, it's the quantity that is ordered at the when the stock reaches the re when the stock reaches the reorder stock level. That is what you have to understand. So economic order quantity has the formula has the formula as 2COG over HCO, which simply means that CO is the cost of ordering, cost of ordering inventory, D is the annual demand of the organization, the annual demand for our goods, and then HCO is simply the holding costs. Remember we said that total cost of the organization includes ordering cost, holding cost, purchases cost, and then stock out cost. So we're going to use the economic order quantity. That is, if the real order quantity is not given, then you have to use the economic order quantity formula. The final thing we want to discuss in relation to accounting for material is to look at the material control accounts how do we prepare material control accounts this is where we do some double entry things double entry things here so i'm going to use an example and quickly illustrate how the double entry will be done in relation to material so example one bossy company manufactures a single product and has the following transactions for material during a particular period one, raw materials of $500,000 were purchased on credit from a supplier. And the supplier name is Timid Co. Now, so if you buy raw material from a supplier, what is the double entry? Simple. And we are buying it on credit. So we're going to open the, so we, we debit what we call the material control account with the $500,000, right? Then we credit the supplier's account. Supplier account. In this case, we are told it is timid co with that same $500, $500,000. So when you buy inventories on credit, you debit your material control account for the purchases of the inventory and you credit the supplier's account. Assuming we bought it with cash or we bought it by paying cash or check, they would have credited our bank or our cash account. Second, raw material costing 30000 were returned to the same supplier due to defect. So you bought a thing from the supplier and you are now returning to the supplier due to defects in the products. So in that case, what do you do? You credit, sorry, you will now debit the supplier accounts. You debit the supplier's accounts. We were told it's 10,000. Then you credit your material control accounts. With that same 10,000. So this is the purchases, this is the return to the supplier. Third, the store, the total store requisition for direct material for the period were four hundred thousand. 
So store requisition. So it means production department request for four hundred thousand inventory. Now, if production department requests for goods, what it means is that we are going to be transferring from the material account to the store department or to the work in progress account. So since it is into the production department, we put it into work in progress account. So we're going to debit work in progress. With the 400,000, right? Then we credit the material control account with that same 400,000. Because when we issue goods to be produced, we always record it in the raw or work in progress account. Four, total issue of indirect material during the year or during the period amounted to. 15,000. Indirect material during the year amounted to 15,000. Now, if it is a direct material, we take it to, to the work in progress. But since it's an indirect material, which is still being transferred from the material control account, we will put it into the factory overhead account. So what is going to happen is that we will debit the factory overhead account, the factory overhead account, OH, we were told that it is 15,000, then we will credit the material control account with that same 15,000. So please note this very well. If we purchase, this is the treatment. If you are returning the goods, this is the treatment. If we are issuing for production, this is the treatment. If we are issuing for production and it is a direct material, we take it to work in progress. If we are issuing to production but it is an indirect material, it goes to the factory overhead account. Then let's see what else is there. 5,000 of unused materials were returned to store from production. 500 of unused material were returned to store from production. So. From the store, work in progress, they are now returning the goods to the material control account. Now, since you can't see up here or down there, let me take it up there. So what it means is that we're going to debit our material control account with a return that was brought, that's 5,000, then we credit the work in progress. also 5,000. So this is what you have to understand when it comes to what we call preparation of the material control account. Now the examiner can bring an extract where he asks you to prepare account or he asks you to find out how these things can be recorded in the books and that is the treatment in that order. I could also have done T accounts for each of them but I think that I wanted to just put the rules down for you and once you know the rule you can prepare the T account for the material control account, prepare the T account for the supplier account, prepare the T account for the work in progress account and prepare the T account for the factory overhead account and that will help you to be able to understand the question. At the end of the day, when we balance, at the end of the day, when we balance the material account, the material account, that will be the amount that is outstanding as closing inventory for the year. Then at the end of the year or the period, when we balance the work in progress account, whatever amount that is outstanding will be taken to the finished product account. Now, in work in progress account also, if there is labor cost, we will do that under accounting for labor. But I'm not just giving you a, a, a bite of it here. In work in progress account, anything that relates to the production of the product comes to the work in product progress account. So issues about direct labor will come to the uh, work in progress account. Issues about indirect labor will come to the factory overhead account. So these are what you have to understand when we talk about accounting for inventory.